I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. We got Zach in the house today. Zach had a little uh, hiatus while he's doing movie things. Zach, how's the movie going? Everything's rolling. September 28th. Um, yeah, I was meeting with some radio stations yesterday about some promotional stuff. So yeah, it's going good. Good. It's going good. We're excited about it. I've been out uh, promoting it where I go, uh, talking about it. Of course, it really fits perfectly into what I talk about because I kind of talk about our family and what God did as a result of the life change that mom and dad had. So it, it's a perfect fit yeah. for that, which is really good. Yeah, we're glad you're here, Zach. Zach, I don't know if you knew this, but somebody put us mm-hmm. up for podcast of the year. So I thought you uh, would. I heard about that. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. I heard we about thought this it. might I'm be the, news one, to you, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one who, no, I'm, the, no, I'm just kidding. I don't know that. No, but I did hear about it. Um, and I, it's exciting. Yeah. I thought why. that may be why you returned. All of a sudden, <laughs> unannounced. Yeah, I wanted like, to. Yeah. Oh, in I case we win, I want to be here. <laughs> <I> guess, <laughs> so. yeah, Zach will show up for an award. So, and remember this. Yeah, so, yeah. Zach, today I'm is here. the last day to vote, by the way. You can vote at KLoveFanAwards.com. It does unlock opportunities. You can look, and it's kind of cool. It's kind of a, the more votes that come in just overall from for everybody then it unlocks um, these uh, like give back programs to plant churches and provide resources for um, churches in um, and unreached people groups and things like that. I can't remember. It's all on the website. It's pretty cool. So it's, it's, it's a, it really is a give back program. I like that idea too. It wasn't just about, Hey, we're, we're saying you guys are good. It was like, we're going to help by preaching the gospel, which is what we're all about. This oh, you know what this reminds me of? Cause you know, Zach used to be a politician. <laughs> Because I just heard him say, this is, this is not voting. This is unlocking opportunity. You know, when you say things like that, that's how you become a politician. <laughs> so I got a question for you. If we lose, Zach, will we ever see you again? <laughs> I, I don't want to answer that because then we people might sabotage us. But I don't want this guy back on here. So. That's right. Any of our Zach haters, we don't give them a reason to not come back. So. Well, the 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 yeah. fruit, the fruit of our labors every every week doing a podcast, a couple hours each week. Oh, it's more uh, than a couple hours, fruit, but okay. <laughs> the fruit that I witnessed with my own eyes, a couple from Florida a businessman from New York City. They were seated Sunday morning. I was doing the class. Basically, about all I know, biblically speaking, as far as the knowledge of it, is the gospel. God becoming flesh, Jesus dying on a cross. We're reading about it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I've I've said more than once why put four men writing the same thing so you can't miss it out? That's right. Yeah. God had us look at it. Jesus, he appears, born of a woman, born in a barn, yep. the Savior of the world. Born under law. And all the battles he goes through, saying all the time, we're going up to Jerusalem. This thing hits away with what we're going to do. And they're going the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the most religious people on the face of the earth said, they're going to kill me, but in three days I'll, I'll come back from the dead. Well, everybody looked around at each other, and Peter and then Peter was saying, no way, that's going to happen. So if you just look at and put it all together, I've never came, I've never come close to reading a story that will outdo it. Well, you're right. I see the fruit. So I baptized those four people. I can't remember where the other guy was from, but the New York Vintage man said he hadn't planned on being baptized that morning, but I just gave him the verses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You did it, You know, go make disciples and baptize them. Well, and I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. The four men from... You know, with with different backgrounds. To me, it was just fruit. Yeah, they wrote they, they wrote the gospel accounts, and now we got four men here that are talking about it. You know, two thousand yep. years later, that's our job. So the most funny thing that happened Sunday, so because it was a contrast, because when the when Phil introduced the New York businessman to me, I mean, I was thinking 
no, I've got plenty of insurance. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He just he was decked out in a suit, but he was with Phil. It yeah. just seemed weird. A little bit of a contrast, you're saying, between the two. It was like we just baptized him. And I was like, oh, fantastic. Welcome aboard. So then when you started preaching, you know, Phil and Kay were sitting behind me, and uh, Phil was like providing commentary to the new brother <laughs> Behind me. Was he translating my sermon to it? The whole time. I would just point to the verses you were covering. Right. The problem I would, was. I would point to the verses that mentioned that. Well, I but he, I for the first time, think about it. He'd been up in New York, been this man, he's not really into the Bible. Yeah. But he he he, he sees the co- co- this this what we're doing right now. Right. The, the, he sees that. He's he experienced it. The problem was, Phil, you know, his hearing is not what it used to be. <laughs> and I think Phil thought he was whispering. <clears throat> And uh, but it was way louder. <laughs> Missy said something. She said, "Turn around, and tell your dad he's being really loud." And I was like, "I'm not doing that." <laughs> and so, so about almost when your sermon was over, I heard Kay say, "I mean, she did it like this. She was trying to whisper, but she can't whisper either. No. She's like, Phil, you're whispering so loud, the whole half of the congregation is." <laughs> I started laughing so hard. I wish I had known that was all happening in it real was. time. I would have. I was supplying your your sermon. Yep. To him, and and he told me later when when he left, I left. Good to see you, man. So I don't know whether I'll ever see him again. He's in New York, but he he was thanking me for you were talking, and and I was looking. I was showing him to add a little. You were just you were just making it real. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it was it was kind of awkward, but it was good. I mean, the guy was excited, and uh, we got tickled about it. But well, and then our old friend uh, Kurt, who's a, a Jesus man. Oh man, I, I hit yeah. into some point there, and he couldn't contain himself. Yeah. That was three quarters of the way in. The, all rows jumped. He yelled out so loud because he was actually right behind us, and I don't know if it was the spirit, the whispering. <laughs> The guy from New York or Al's sermon, but it all just went to a boiling point, and it was everything he had. It was. He went, Jesus. Well, he had a suit on, you know, a nice suit. And when 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 that brother got up, you know, he had them old baggy pants, and you know, what'd you call him, Rucker? Oh no, it was uh, it was the guy, our youth guy. I said he looked like a redneck samurai. Yeah, yeah. He had a big beard, but his hair was up in a man bun, and he was just wearing like gym shorts. I, I j- all I told he looked him, like he was very relaxed. I like told he was the guy in New to- York, I said you don't have to get all dressed up. <laughs> No, I heard that line. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I heard you. And he was just like, he was just watching, you know. Well, that, that I, made him feel a little awkward because he could not have been dressed any nicer. It right. was like, you don't have to do that. Look at that guy. <laughs> if you want to, but I, I just. And I felt, I, I usually don't like to comment about what how people look, but I just couldn't help yeah. myself because he did the contribution talk and I just, you know, I had to comment. I couldn't help myself. And he preached last Sunday, so it gave me a chance to brag on him. So anyway, I didn't mean to. I, I know we've all been there where you have the running commentary of the family while the sermon is going. It was like I was doing some kind of uh, the old duck show. Yeah. Because it was so funny. I couldn't stop Ordinary that. and unschooled men. <laughs> when people heard what they were saying, they were like, how in the world did that bunch know all that, give all that, that information? Whoa. I was just showing him, I said, you know, it can come from strange places. The opportunities that we've had. So today we've got a couple of guests uh, here uh, in our podcast studio. Uh, Angie Clausen is with I Am Second and her husband Greg are here. And uh, Angie is, uh, we've been doing for years. I mean, this probably back when the show was going on. It's interesting, Jace, because the first time we did it, it was Dad and Jep and Reed. And so we had talked through the concept, and it was kind of like three generations of faith, and really three generations of prodigals. Their story is amazing. And by the way, you can find if you go to IamSecond.com, you can see that. We also did an updated thing with mom and dad a year or two ago, and then we told Phyllis's story, and we told mine and Lisa's story too, and it's called From Dysfunction to Dynasty. So just great people. I love what they're doing. They're about to do one uh, with their old friend Rucker. Uh, I think coming up soon that was on a podcast. And uh, so we, we love what they're doing. Just encourage you guys to check it out. Look, and it's not, there are a ton of people on there that you'll recognize a lot of 
um, athletes and, and, and entertainers and actors and all these people. You that don't have, have to come be a, to Christ, so. and, and I, I am second is, it's a good thing because they've put forth that shows you don't have to be some kind of, uh, brain. Yeah. You know, nah. Right. Fifth grade, sixth grade education, close enough. It's it's just no, a lot great. Yeah. yeah, they're they're. I actually, well, I will say you may not recognize everybody on there. I had an encounter a few years ago. I was in, at an event, and um, Mike Fisher, who is Carrie Underwood's husband, and Jeff Fisher, who I think was a coach of the t- Titans. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Is that right? So they were at an event. I didn't recognize them, but they were saying they were with I am second. And so I'm uh, so embarrassing, but I, I walked up to them. And I was like, Hey, I, I love what you guys are doing. I thought they were like the production crew. <laughs> I said, yeah, you, are, are, are you guys are doing something with my family next week. And they're like, they're like looking at me like, like they had no clue what I was talking about. <laughs> and I went back to the table. I was like, this guy's man, this I am second people. I don't know. They're just they're kind of <laughs> looking at me weird. And, and then they got up and were the keynote speakers. Oh, and I was boy. like, oh. that? <laughs> they were on I am second. They weren't. The, it, it was, oh, yeah, it was man. one of those moments, guys. Did they sing bad. you that song, Mr. No Depth What's the song? <laughs> <laughs> I was embarrassed. <laughs> but, you know, it's hard to – people like that that are like coaches and stuff, sometimes it is hard to recognize because if you know, Fisher's been out of the game for a while. And so, you know, it's like it's like yeah. athletes. They're always wearing a uniform and a helmet. So it's like you see them someplace and you, you kind of think they're probably somebody you know, but unless they've done a lot of stuff, it is. The kinda... beauty of it all was that the brother who was up and had the mic and telling people be generous toward God – the beauty of it all is the the New York business man was sitting there part of that now. Yeah. As of yes, the Sunday morning. He had just become I just baptized him twenty minutes earlier. Right. And he was and he was looking and I said, There's one of your brothers and he was looking at it. it was, he told me it was just amazing. Yeah. And that's kind of the idea of family. Unschooled and ordinary people. Did he come in through the podcast? Is that how he found out about yeah. the, uh, yeah. about the church? Yep. He watched the podcast. So did the couple from Florida. Man and his well, wife. Which, you know, that's the whole idea, right? It's about reaching people. And so any way yeah. we can do that, uh, we're trying to make the uh, internet dad a, a better place uh, by doing good. Yeah. Uh, the other guy, he said, he told me, he said, I just want you to know that I, I've, I'm really, I've committed a lot of sins. I said, we all have, dude. We all have. Welcome aboard. Yep. They fixed to all be washed away here in just a few minutes. So one of the things, and we've kind of tried to bring Dad into the 21st century as much as possible. Uh, not always easy. Dad, you're kind of a, I would say you're a renaissance man. Is that a? Fair assessment of kind. I don't of, know. I wouldn't get too wild, with it. <laughs> but maybe you kind of kind of like the old. I think you could have have lived in the eighteen hundreds as easily as you. I would have done a lot. I would have done a lot, a lot better in the eighteen hundreds. So one of the things that uh, Jace we've helped bring Dad into the um, into the modern era is underwear. Uh, that's not something you talk about very often among guys. No, but, but if, if it if, you know if you don't have a good pair of underwear on that can be well we all grew up like everybody else from our era we had the tidy whities and uh and dad had those and so we we discovered i discovered them first tommy john underwear and uh, now they're a, a sponsor of our podcast which is fantastic they are really a major upgrade in underwear and we even got dad wearing them as well uh, which is good so we've upgraded the renaissance man well, in that was a time when talking about men's underwear would be a little cheesy. <laughs> That's right. But we made it cool. Yeah, because... we're a little more outspoken about it, but <laughs> we're cultured, Dad. Let's face it. Well, uh... So uh, they've sold over twenty million pairs. So obviously, uh, there's a lot of dads out there that love them, uh, including the three of us, uh, and and Zach as well. So they also have a best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free guarantee. Uh, so we want you to check these guys out. You have nothing to lose. You're going to love them. I love them. We love them. Get your Father's Day gifts early at Tommy John's Memorial Day sale now through May 30th. So you can save a little bit of money for Father's Day. It's a great gift. 30% site-wide at TommyJohn.com slash Phil. That's 30% off at TommyJohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details.
So, Zach, we talked about, um, we've been in Luke 4, and so the last couple of podcasts, uh, Jace took us down the rabbit hole of evil spirits and demons. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'll be interested to see the emails you get over <laughs> that. But I did encourage people to read uh, Seeing the Unseen. You yeah, know, Joe Beam's book. Joe Beam. Oh, yeah. And because there's going to yeah. be a lot of this, it wasn't really a plan, I just... You know, we're, we're in John, I mean, we're in Luke chapter four and, you know, he goes to the synagogue in Capernaum and there's a demon possessed man as Jesus is talking, who says, ha, this is 434, <laughs> which I think may be the only time in the Bible that we read the word ha. I hadn't it, thought about it, really it. I thought about it last ha night. Yeah. It's biblical. I, I've actually noticed that before and because missy's always like they had these uh emojis that you can put because she says i always say ha but i said it's biblical and she rolled her eyes and then <laughs> <laughs> let me uh read a little verse uh luke 4 34 ha <laughs> <laughs> so then she brought up an excellent point uh that's a demon saying that jay so i'm like <laughs> Okay, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> it is in the Bible. Yeah, you yeah. got you got to watch your quotes. It's like people. Oh, I, I hear yeah. people quote some of Job's dopey friends because God said they didn't know what they were talking about. But I've heard people like quote those and say, like, "Oh, this is brilliant." Yeah, I was like, as eh. as they're prescriptive, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like you know the well, context. Know we did context. talk about that though, because yeah. there the evil one, you know, was using the you know nature and different things that we usually attribute God to doing. To killing people, yeah. human beings, right. people were getting hurt, using other people th who were evil to influence someone who was trying to do right negatively. So, I mean, that is a precedent that's there. And we went down that road, yeah. but, you know, he hollered out saying, what do you want with us? And it seems to be a common theme that they all knew who Jesus is, because even in this verse of 34 of 4, he says, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And they always surrendered to Jesus' authority. Right. And so, uh, you know, when, when we get to Luke 8, probably the most famous demon possession story, you know, there's a guy that has not just one demon, but a legion. And Which we talked about, that's... In, in the term in that term biblically and and historically was thousands yep so I mean man you think it's one thing to have a demon but for thousands potentially to to be running around I mean that's kind of can crazy. you imagine observing him oh my goodness for you for years right but their line to Jesus was have you come to torture us yeah and then they you know they mention or throw us into the abyss, you know? And yeah. so I just kind of gave a thumbnail introduction of that side. There's two sides. You know, There's we, we went through the, the passage in Kings where the army came up and he said, you know, Elisha said, please open his eyes. And, you know, the, the saying that I had noticed that Al and I had talked about was that the servant, uh, when he saw these angelic armies and chariots, chariots of fire and all yeah, that. with them, they said, you know, we're the ones with us are greater than the ones with them. Yeah. And I made a point because I got it out of Joe Beam's book, but that we usually think, oh, the ones with us are greater than the army we're facing, but that's not what it said. It was the ones with us are greater than the ones with them. And so I made a point that when you look at uh, various polls and all, there's, on average, just over 50% of people in the religious world who believe in demons and the devil and the, they believe in God, but they don't believe on the other side. Which is kind of sad and, and fascinating at the same time that you would have half the people that, who says there's a God don't believe there's a devil. I mean, I don't, Zach, what do you make of that? I mean, that's that's kind of crazy to me, and yet and yet it's true because you know that's what they say. But we were saying that biblically, how do you really 
you know, I mean, the Bible talks a lot about it, especially in the Gospels. I mean, what was going on in the with Jesus in the first century, and we assume it's because him being here is what was having all this, you know, demons going crazy, you know, more than any other time you see in the Bible. But, I mean, it's real. You can't just yeah. deny that it's not there. Probably more comforting, I guess, if you can convince yourself that he's not there because then it's it minimizes the threat. Uh, against you and so it's uh, you almost can convince yourself that i mean we we talked talked about this a lot that passage in uh james that says each one is dragged away and enticed by his own evil desires yep and while that's true uh, we do we I mean, we've said this before you know we don't we can't blame everything on the devil and uh, jace you did a great job a few podcasts back of just drawing that distinction between kind of over spiritualizing it or I mean, everything is you know this demonic attacks or you know man i got cut off in traffic today man the devil is after me yeah that kind of thing that's that's one end of it but the other end is just say he's not there and there's no such thing it's just some kind of idea and there's there's no like personal um force and personality that is wants to destroy you that that's a that's a scary thing if there is a being that his sole intent is your destruction and death i mean that is a scary thing i mean i have a couple people in my life that probably don't like me at all and i don't like that feeling i don't like the fact that there's people out there who but imagine if there if, the, if you had somebody in who had the kind of power that satan has who his intent and he had a legion of legions of of, of demons and his goal in in his existence was to destroy everything about your life yeah That's look, at, look at the logic of this John chapter 7, about verse 13 or 14, yeah, about, about 19. Has not Moses given you the law? You Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You, you know what their answer was? You're demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Mm. They said, who's trying to kill you? But they're the ones who did kill him. Oh, yeah, you know, that's it. it turned yeah. out. And that's interesting. We didn't even go there in our discussion about how many times, because remember the same thing happened to John 8, yep. that they were saying Jesus could only be doing it because they couldn't explain that he was the Messiah. Yep. So the only other power they knew to go to is said, well, he's got to be demon possessed. And Jesus' point was, well, how, if I'm demon possessed, why would I be casting out my own? You know, group. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, and that's when he said a house divided, you know, can't stand. Be, can't stand. Right. Because the idea is if I'm evil, then why am I throwing out evil spirits? It didn't make any sense. But from their perspective, if you can't recognize him he as said God. They had a father, but it wasn't his father, Jesus's father. He said, You have a father. He said, But you're, you're, you're he's about murder yeah. and lying. Murders and lies. He's the father of murder and the father of the lies, and and you you you're doing what he says. Right. It, but so, which led to another moment where they wanted to kill him. <laughs> back uh, to the demons again. Uh, I think it goes back to two personal, like personal autonomy and personal sovereignty. Which is, as humans, we tend to overestimate our own personal autonomy and sovereignty quite often. And I think if you can convince yourself, or you can just reject the notion that there's a devil or that there is this demonic world out there, then you it gives us a sense of false security that we think we can manage sin. And um, we, But when you understand that the force is against you, you realize you can't manage sin. I mean, if you try to manage sin, then sin will end up managing you. And so you look at somebody, you know, I think I may have mentioned this on a previous podcast. You know those, um, you get them at the gas station, they'll be like before and after pictures of like people with meth addiction. Yeah. You see the before picture and they're like this beautiful person. And then the after picture is, I mean, just completely wrecked, no teeth, sores all over their face. You look at that, you think, how could you, like, how could you be given over to that? And the answer is, is there somebody who wants to destroy you? Yeah. And so it, there, there does need to be a, a healthy fear. The biggest lie I ever told myself was that I can manage my own sin. Yeah. And that's the better. If, I, if, I, if I, I can look at this, I can do this, I can be a part of this, I can participate in this, and this not affect me because I, I know better. And every time that I've walked into those paths um, without repentance, I would have it would have destroyed me. But it's it's it, it, it never worked out. I never could manage it. And I think that's why we want to believe that the devil's not real because it gives us the illusion 
that we can manage our own sin. Somehow you're right. It makes us less powerful if we, if we admit he's there. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Name this tune. <laughs> you remember that, Dad? Oh, yeah. The classic? The theme song. Yeah, good, good. That's good behind it. Yeah. The good, the bad, and the, the bad ugly. and the ugly. That was the, the Bible speaks of all three. So Jesus uses that uh, back when he was helping raise the, uh, their little one uh, that they've been working with. That was kind of to to calm the savage. Every time I make that sound, he stops crying. So all right. there you go. There's your parenting tip. So the reason that I had Jace do that uh, leading into our Barrel Buddy ad was because I guess that's one of our... We, we were talking about for the scene from that movie because Eastwood is cleaning his gun. Every time you turn around, he's cleaning his gun. There's a message there. That's exactly right. Um, Very important. I don't want to ruin the movie for you, but the good wins. <laughs> One mistake could be deadly. Uh-oh, this hang up. And that movie is a dusty movie, too, because they're oh, out yeah. there with the wind blowing. So that's what our friends at Barrel Buddy, um, that's what they do. Uh, they help make sure that our, our guns stay clean, uh, specifically the gun barrel, which is very important. And the old ways that we used to do it was with the square patches, which didn't go too well in a round hole. You had the boar snake, which came along after that. The problem with the boar snake is once you use it once, you can't tell really what you're getting out of your gun. And so these guys have come up with a white polymer. Uh, you're going to push this through your barrel, and you're going to see exactly what comes out. And as they say on their packaging here, clean your gun without the grunge. So we can get the grunge out of those guns. So I want you to check these guys out. Great company, uh, Believers, uh, which we love about that about them as well. So it's BarrelBuddy.com is where you go to get their product. B-A-R-R-E-L Buddy, BarrelBuddy.com. Check them out. Yeah, so that's basically, we just gave a thumbnail version. Uh, I mean, we went pretty much two previous podcasts talking about that. But we wound up in the practical day and modern time because, you know, when Paul wrote to the Romans, he said that, you know, we're more than conquerors, this Romans 8, 37, through him who loved us. And he said, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons Neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we also brought up Paul's instructions to Timothy in 1 Peter 4, 1 that says that in later times people would abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And we, we talked in, about that in quite detail, but to go back to Luke and how that applies to us, the fact that Jesus has authority over that gives me great comfort. Yeah, me too. And it is a complex world when you when you start breaking it down and the idea of demons being the dead wicked who have come back to earth and you have the evil one as a fallen angel and then his angels and that entourage. But it but like Zach said, I do think there's nothing wrong with a healthy fear of of going in cahoots with that with that bunch, because we we've been clear on this podcast because we believe the Bible's clear that sin comes from our own selfish ambitions. I mean, there's multiple passages. It all starts there, and the evil one and, and the entourage just gives you excuses and lies and rationalization to to do it. But and you think about though, Jay, to reject a concept of that there was a, a, a pioneer of evil. What you're saying, because a lot of people say, well, yeah, you guys, you just believe in this boogeyman and the devil made me do it, and blah, blah, blah. But you think about it, the world's full of boogeymen and evil and right. bad things. So to not have a worldview where you recognize that really just ignores all the bad things that you see. It, it, oh. It's much more comforting to me to know at least what I'm up against. As opposed to saying, I don't what believe in any of that stuff, and yet I've got to deal with it every single day in some city or some place I live. Yeah, I, I think a good analogy, like a good metaphor or analogy to understand how I think the devil works, 
in, in correlation with what Jace just said, think about how algorithms in social media are so sophisticated that they, they don't make you want things. They don't tell, but, but they, they figure out kind of what you're bent towards and then they feed that side of you. And that's why if you look at someone's social media feed and you compare it to someone who's on the complete opposite end of the spectrum from them, their, their worlds are going to look totally different. Their online community is going to look totally different because the algorithm knows what you, what you're kind of bent towards. And then its goal is to keep you as engaged as possible. And so it's just feeding you that. And I think that's how the devil works with us. He knows what we're bent towards. And so he just keeps feeding you that to get you more engaged into it to the point where ultimately the end of what he's after. I want, I want your destruction, but but you have to choose to go down that path. And I do think there's a level you get to where, I mean, then you've in Phil, you've been around some of them. I mean, you've talked about some of your encounters with people that have been really shocking to, to know, uh, the, the, you can be completely taken over by something at some point. No doubt. Oh, there's no, so it's not. Yeah. yeah, we got there. I mean, we, we read that story about David and Saul, you know, David coming in playing the harp and, because it said the Holy Spirit had left Saul, yeah. and an evil spirit had come upon had him. Come upon him, yeah. So they when, got when they spoke at Angola, it's a prison in Louisiana where they put life imprisonment for human beings. I, we noticed that that the warden didn't let them all out of the cell box. Some of them you can't you can't let them you can't let them yeah. loose like that. I mean, inside the prison. So the ones that were there that we spoke to, there were many of them converted, by the way, but and, and some in the cell blocks, they were they were allowing it. What we were saying to be pumped down in the where the where the ones that can't they can't mix with including, anybody, including death row, yeah, including right. death row. But some of them did request. Would, would they ask the warden? Could they be baptized in the lake down there yeah. and he let he allowed him to do it most prisons that said wouldn't do that but but he allowed the those and i felt good about it after well, it's definitely not going to hurt yeah not going to hurt at all to drown somebody they were too dangerous to be in a any kind of setting where there's other human beings dad started out in galatians 3 the whole world's a prisoner of sin and he looked right in the camera and he said just because you're in prison doesn't mean that you can't be free. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, a line. great line. It's that I said, you so, can be, you but can... I was I was midway through that story of saying that when when David sang spiritual God centered songs, the evil spirit left, which is was providing peace in Saul's heart, and comfort. And, yeah, yeah, and peace is a fruit of the spirit. So we made that point about now we have the the arsenal. With understand who Jesus is, his authority over not just the demons, but we're going to get to what he has authority over next. But and there's all sorts of things. But we also have the confidence that he gives us his Holy Spirit. So, I mean, you can surrender to Jesus, receive God's Spirit, and feel a peace despite the fact that you're surrounded by a sinful, a uh, dark world. You I mean, are correct. So, I feel like we should continue on. Yeah, read, and, start read, read that because uh, we, we just referenced it. But read that thirty-eight through forty-four days. And I think I left. I don't think I read thirty-six. And so I'll, yeah, I'll restart start there. there. All the people were amazed and said to each other, "What is this? With authority and power, he gives orders to evil spirits, and they come out." And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. So Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. Now, this is Peter, but yeah. he was called Simon. Yeah, he hadn't changed his name yet. Or hadn't added which I noticed uh, in, our, in our prep. So in chapter 5, when we get to this miraculous catch of fish, he's, actually, he's called Simon here. He's called Simon Peter there. Yeah. And you know that's the only place he's called that. Right. And then he's called Peter after that. Right. So something really must have happened in that boat. <laughs> well, and we talked about Luke's style of writing is a little different than the other Gospels. So he, he likes to kind of introduce the major characters. And so I think that's why he included the story about the mother-in-law, but that's just me guessing. Well, I mean, it's an incredible story. And, and I do think there's a thread of this where people that you don't notice, that you take advantage of, the poor, the lepers, 
uh, people from the wrong side of the tracks. In this case, some Syrians and Samaritans. And this book, Luke's book is filled with the people that people have given up on that Jesus has these interactions with or not notice. I mean, because you're like, well, this is all about Peter. Well, then he tells this cool story about his mom, which— Or mother-in-law. A um, um, uh, mother-in-law who's not even developed before or after this, right. which is another reason why I believe this to be true. It's like, why throw in the detail about that? Which is kind of amazing, Jason. kind of amazing to me and, and really I think that Chosen does a good job with it by showing the interaction of Peter and his wife because yeah. we, we don't know anything other than he was married but that kind of puts him in a different light with all the other disciples because because they were all young and we're assuming that he was the only one married he may not have been but we know he had that going on and so I've yeah. always wondered about that how that interacted with him following Jesus around for three years and he's right. got a wife. Yeah, I was crawling around on my hands and knees here the last few months ago, back, you know, you know, vertebrae, you know, cracked vertebrae. And I'm looking. We remember it well, Dad. And trust me when I tell you that when I read about, ask Jesus, the, uh, the woman had a mother in law was suffering from a high fever. They asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her, and I don't even know, this is scary, and rebuked the fever. And it left her. She got up at once, began to wait on him. And then she, she, she just got up and said, right, right oh, thanks for that. So there was no recovery I mean, time needed. It was just. So how, would you have appreciated? I thought myself, I said, boy, I'm glad I had him on my side because my back doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> would you have liked I, I would, would be, you have liked I would be hesitant to tell people, Jesus, well, you know, how you doing with your back, Phil? I said, Jesus rebuked it and it's gone. But that's what happened here. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what happened. My back doesn't hurt anymore. Immediate. I mean, I'm crawling around on my hands and knees for about two months. It's all gone Would now. You said it took you 30 minutes to get out of the bed? Yeah. So what? what's ironic about all this is Jesus' actions became contagious. Because when you read the next verse in 40, when the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. Yeah. There you and, go. And laying Word his got out. Well, yeah. I mean, you're going to see this as we continue. The really the ironic nature of what Jesus was doing, from even in in Luke five when he, you know, Peter sees this miracle. Well, he has the opposite response than what most people have when they see a miracle. You know, when you see a miracle, people are thinking. Uh, you know, they're jumping up and down, you know, our Pentecostal friends, yeah. they're, you know, this is, it's and it's so crazy that Peter sees a miracle and he falls down and says, go away from me, yeah. uh, which is the, the very thing that Jesus is telling the demons to do mm -hmm. to him. And I bring that up because then he goes into leprosy and well, you wouldn't back then, you know, they, in leprosy is kind of not the word, you know, I looked at that back then. It'd be a, le a various. Yeah, it was all kinds disorder. of skin, but but the the problem with all that was is they were considered social outcasts. They right. weren't even allowed in the temple. They were social outcasts. It was more about, and you couldn't touch them, you know, because they didn't know if it was contagious and some of the disease were. Well, what did Jesus do? He did the very last thing that you'd ever do if you're around someone who's a social outcast because of a some kind of. I mean, think pandemic here. Right. He touched him. Well, he didn't have to touch him to heal him. Why did he touch him? Because he was a social outcast, because he was all, all of it, and he healed him. And so what's ironic in all these stories is most of the time when you touch someone that's infected, you become infected. Yeah. He touched someone who's infected and made him clean, which is crazy that he would even touch him and he he brought him back in so so i think, I think about jace every sunday when we're at our church because seated right behind me on the second row as a family and they have i'm assuming I, i've never asked them but it looks like they have elephantitis which is kind of these you know deformities and gross and it's just a genetic thing in their family but you know uh, every sunday they're there 
they're part of our church family. If people come up and hug them and love them, and, and I talk to them all the time because they're in my proximity. But I thought about it. You know, this is these are people that would have been outcast, but instead yeah. they're in a family. And it's the same thing you're describing. I mean, Jesus. You know, a lot of these demons, to show you the power that hover, was hovering over people, you're the son of God. Well, but I'm he, getting to that, Phil. Hang on. Yeah, so, go so, ahead. Yeah, so we're in 40. So he said, when the sun was setting, the, he, they brought people. The people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God, which was the same thing the first one did up there. They were acknowledging who Mm -hmm. he was, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. And so you got to remember, he was trying to hide all of this to a certain degree so that he could. Yeah, it's timing. uh, Yeah, it wasn't time yet. He he was going to eventually go to a cross and he knew that. So at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. I I love this. Uh, You know, despite all this going on, he goes out there. He'd been going at it all night here. (laughs) But he's praying to God in every, he showed us how, because life is difficult. We get tired. Uh, You're dealing with not only the evils of the world, but people who are hurting, they're outcasts, the drama with all that. He's doing it all day. Uh, the Chosen, speaking of that show, they did a really good episode about this. I just well, thought about that. That could have been a fifth point to my sermon, Jays, is the Son of Man relates to us because he got tired. Well, exactly. He got he got tired of doing what he was doing, physically, emotionally, all of it. The you Chosen know? did an episode. It was really unique. There was like no camera cut on the side of uh, this his followers. And they basically were arguing about various things. And Jesus was not even on it. Yeah. And so at the end, he comes up. I mean, he's he's bloodied, tired. He's been, you know, serving people. All, he, it was in reference to this verse. Yeah. And it nobody said a word, but it all hit him. Here we are, been arguing about this and that. <laughs> While he was out there doing all this, you know, yeah. he looked at him. He's like, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. You know, and only his mom was like, it recognized yeah. in the moment. And so. Because people will tend to draw out whatever they have to for themselves. It's just the nature of people, you know. So you're convicted watching that because we know, what do we do? We gripe and complain about first world problems here all yeah, the time. All the time. You know, meanwhile. Like no that, air conditioning that, that, in your truck. All right. That, well, hey, that was, we, we had fun with that. Uh, so, you anyway. repented. You repented. Hang on, let's take our last break. So, let me read this last paragraph. So, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, and I think this is important. So you remember when he says in, in where we're at in 43 of 4, he says, but he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom to other towns also because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues in Judea. And that was definitely a reference back to. Yeah, the angel said to Mary in Luke 1, yep. 33, yeah. And his kingdom will never end. Yep. So, I mean, Jesus came, he was a fulfillment, you know, Daniel and all the other prophecies that he was going to be king of kings, his kingdom would never end. And he was out speaking about that because a lot of people said, what exactly was he saying? I mean, he was bringing people together, declaring himself as not only the son of man, but the son of God. And I think people were concluding that he was the bridge to God. And you made this point before when we've done the different studies in the Gospels that Jesus' purpose in coming here was not to heal sick people and not to give money to poor people. And he even said that himself, the poor you always have, sick you'll always have. That's not what. That's not his purpose of coming here. Now, when he was here, he did that to show his power and authority so that they would listen to what he had to say. But it was always a kingdom message. Yep. And so you don't want to get people get thrown off in that today because they want to make everything about the healing and the miracle, well, the miracle. And, and you miss the point. Well, he's fixed yeah. to turn that on its head when we get to the next miracle about you know, the guy being let down through the roof. And yeah, he's like the hole in the roof gangs. What I call 
he's like, your well, sins are forgiven. <laughs> it was like the biggest <laughs> drop mic moment right. ever. And people are like, what? What? What did he say? The man's... <laughs> He, he's he's paralyzed. Yeah, your sins are forgiven. Yeah, that's not but why that, he came. It was a, it was a you know the the guy what I like to refer to it as he got more than he asked for. Yeah, that's he right. came for. But so he's going to make that principle that you're saying. He came here to die for our sins. Yep, uh, to be resurrected. That that's what saves people. He's better than the miracles, and uh, you know it does offend people when they hear that. Sometimes they're like, "What? What? what? He he's Jesus is better." than any miracle you're going to come up with. That's why I even... But it why, is miraculous that he stayed three days in the ground and was standing up out of the grave, continuing what he was starting. The ultimate miracle. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, Phil, if you have that miracle, that pretty much... You don't need to worry about the rest of it. Everything else, <laughs> That's right. obsolete. That's why, you know... You, I, you I, are I, correct. As a joke, I used to say when people say, do you believe in miracles? And I'd say, I believe in at least one. <laughs> That's a, and, yeah. and people wouldn't know they wouldn't understand what I was saying but I, yeah. that was the point I was making I was like the resurrection is the miracle of all miracles because huh? then you're like what are you going to do 10 million years from now life like, and oh, immortality has uh, just been shown to you right in your face you're not going to say 10 million years from now oh uh, you know I need someone to, to cure me or hit. no you're you've been raised imperishable so we live in a broken world, a dark world. We have perishable bodies. Bad things are going to happen. And we say all the time, these people who had these miracles, they all died. Yep. Yeah. So if they put their eggs in that basket, just the experience of it all, well, what did that really do? Yep. And, and miss the resurrection somehow? And even it? Lazarus and John 11... He was raised from the dead, but guess what? He died again. He still died. He still died. <laughs> yeah, I love that part you read about uh, Zechariah earlier when he talked about the kingdom. It's the invitation of the, 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 or the coming of the kingdom in Jesus, which is, you mentioned Daniel. I just got two verses here out of Daniel two, uh, 2 and one out of Daniel 7 that I think tie up that whole thought of the kingdom Jesus bringing the kingdom and Jesus being the son of man. In Daniel 2, when when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of the statue that was different layers of different types of material that represented different kingdoms, you know, the Medo-Persian Empire, the, it, it ends up with Rome. It says, in those days, this is verse 40, 44 of Daniel 2, and in, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will that shall never be destroyed nor shall the kingdom be left to another people so you think about like that prophecy in the in the book of daniel is being fulfilled right here in this moment when he says that he he's going to set up this kingdom that will last forever and then in daniel 7 just a few chapters later um he has this entrance um of of the son of man coming into the kingdom or coming coming to, to earth he says um in my vision at night this is daniel seven thirteen. i looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven and he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence he was given authority glory and sovereign power all nations and people of every language worshiped him his dominion this is the language here same language is ever is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So it's it's I, I think you're so right, Jace. If you get hung up on like the miracles as being the end of the whole thing, then you've missed the kingdom. I mean, all of the miracles just point to the kingdom, and they and and by, by virtue they point ultimately to the king of the kingdom. Exactly. And that's the purpose of it. I mean, that's theoretically, the you could be healed. Let's say you have something that has no cure. And you go and you're here, a miracle happens. And you're so excited, you trip down the stairs and break your neck and die. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a thud, you know. I mean, that was a that was a joy killer. But what I'm saying is, theoretically, is that not possible? Yeah. Well, I mean, he. It, this is bigger than him coming in and intervening with your momentary problem. I mean, this is what he does. So why is he doing all this? Because most of... These people, 
that he's helping were overlooked for whatever reason. And you got to remember, this has always been like this. We Human beings are mean. It's like when things don't go your way or something happens or you're sick, we're like, well, God, he just, he's not, he doesn't approve of who you are. You know, look at me. I'm beautiful. He yeah. thinks I'm awesome. And so Jesus turns all that on its head because he goes out there and finds the outcast, the broken, the poor, those with le- leprosy, various, these mad men. We, we'll get to them. But he's really uh, throwing religion on its head because he's saying, I'm giving out this power right. to you. You don't. I'm I'm taking the weak and I'm making them powerful. And all other religions are if you work hard enough and long enough and become good and powerful, you will be successful in the afterlife. But it's also, Jace, this is a huge moment that Luke is chronicling here because this is the first time when Jesus starts talking about the kingdom. And it's going to be all over the place once we get into it. Right. But this is the first time he drops this concept. Because think about it. They've all, all they're thinking about is the kingdom of Israel. Well, right. You That's know, going to so, help us leading into this right. next story. But, I mean, that that is, we're, we're going to constantly be reminded that they, they were looking at it as national sovereignty Right. They're looking for a king to lead them and destroy. They want to be and again switch places with Rome. I think guess. about that it. Jason. Guy asked me uh, uh, the the New York businessman asked me what group were we with? What religious group? I said there's too many to even talk about it. I said, but just remember, and I showed him Colossians chapter one, having great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father. He's qualified you, and I told him, I said. You've been qualified. You're in. Qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. It doesn't make a difference. Demon possessed. All of us have been controlled by the evil one. And brought us. I said it's already happened. Brought. Past tense. Brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of sin. I said you're a member of the kingdom when they ask you. Yeah. You know, are you this, are you that, are you that, 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 all these groups. That was a good response. I Great said, response. I said, you're just a member of the kingdom. I usually say. He said, he said that's, that's clear enough. I said. I usually say God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. That can be taken plural or singular. <laughs> yep. That's, that's, the club, that's the club I'm in. Hold on. I remember one thing. I remember Phil at a speech one time. He said, you ask who, who I'm with. He said, the Father son the spirit and he said and san panero <laughs> his heart like, his heart like, surgeon it was like, it was hard <laughs> it was with him at the time that was good with they all started looking through their bible san panero who's that <laughs> all right we're out of time uh we'll we'll continue talking a little bit more about this uh, kingdom concept in our overtime segment if you want to follow us over blaze tv.com slash unashamed is where you get our overtime thanks for listening to the unashamed podcast help us out by rating us on itunes And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.